Oh, good morning. It's good to be in God's house, isn't it? Merry Christmas. How did we get here? How did that happen? Yeah, I don't know, but we're here. Amen? How many of you have your Christmas decorations up? You're done. All right. How many of you, you're not sure when it's going to happen? You're hoping that the holiday fairies come and take care of everything? How many of you are done with your shopping? Wow. Apparently, you sit in the back row, you're done with your shopping. So that's where you need, if you want to know how to do that, just shift over to there and they'll, they'll help you out. The, the season is upon us, but we are not quite done with Ephesians. We've been in Ephesians, can you believe this, for 16 weeks. And it's been a, a great journey. And when we began, I talked about this concept of deep church, but I haven't mentioned it a lot since. We hear the word deep a lot in Christian circles. Have anyone ever heard, and maybe you've been guilty, I know I have, I've said this, I, I, I want to go deeper. I, I want to be a deeper Christian. Anyone ever said that or heard that at any point in your life? Every time I hear that, even when I say it, I wonder what I even, what does that even mean? What does it mean? So we, we titled this whole series, Deep Church. What does it mean to be a deep church, to be a deep person, to go deeper into God's word? I'm glad you ask. Because that's what we're going to talk about a little bit this morning. And when you hear deep, the word that is kind of the antithesis of that is shallow. Now, I don't think there's very many of us here that want to be shallow people or want us to be a shallow church, do we? No. So we want to figure out how do we go from this idea of being shallow to being deep because we know we're not supposed to be shallow people. But I want to tell you that in this concept of shallow and deep, I, I want to kind of change the idea of what shallow means because we have this negative idea of the word shallow. If you're a shallow person, what are you? Superficial. Superficial. You only care about things that are on the surface, right? And that's not a very good thing. But how many of you have ever learned how to swim? Okay. How many of you got thrown into the deep end to learn how to swim? Some of you did. How many of you enjoyed that experience? Probably not very many of you. How many of you started out in the shallow end of the pool as a kid? I did. Shallow end of the pool was awesome when you're a kid. And being in the shallow end, there's not any responsibility. You don't need to learn how to swim. There, there's not really any risk. Yes, there's a lifeguard there, but how often does someone actually drown in the shallow end? It's usually when they take the risk of going out into the deep end. I'm not saying it never happens, but usually it's the deep end that's scary and dangerous, isn't it? What do you need to know or be willing to do to hang out in the shallow end of the pool? You just got to be willing to get wet. That's it. And uh, there's a lot of splashing and a lot of fun that happens in the shallow end. But eventually we know we need to move from the shallow end to the deep end because the really fun stuff happens in the deep end. Now, to move from the shallow end to the deep end, what has to happen? You got to learn. You gotta be willing to take a risk and step out and have some adventure. You need to learn, if not to swim, what do you at least need to learn? You had to tread water. You got to do the doggy paddle thing or flail around a lot. Now, I want to tell you, I'm not talking about edge clingers. You know what I'm talking about. What are edge clingers? Yeah, they just climb out on the edge and they hold on. But do they ever let go? No, they're just stuck on the ledge. Okay, those aren't deep water people. Those are shallow people who are hoping to be deep people. They just want to kind of get a taste of it. But they want to do the work that it takes to get into the deep end. Now, when we bring this back into Christian circles, let, let me tell you what, in what Paul is talking about, about being a deep church. He's talking about moving from the shallow end where things are easy and they're simple and there's not any risk. All you got to do is be willing to kind of show up. He's talking about moving from that to the deep end, which is risky, it's dangerous, it's hard, and you have to learn some things and put those things into practice. Now, if you learn to swim, but you don't swim, and I throw you into the deep end, let's say you read a good pamphlet on it, or you do what I do when I want to learn something, where's the best place to learn something? YouTube. You can learn anything on YouTube. You may not learn it right, but you can learn anything on YouTube. So I go to YouTube and I learn how to swim. Should I then be thrown into the deep end? 
No, because I haven't worked at it yet, right? So in, in the context of what we're talking about, with being a deep church, being deep people, what I'm really talking about is moving from the things that we know, head knowledge, to things that we do, that we put into practice. And Paul has done that. He, that's kind of the model that he's shown us through the book of Ephesians. The first three chapters of Ephesians, Paul tells us the things that we need to know, foundational truths, Things like God has called you. He has a plan for your life. He loves you and he cares for you. And it's important that we know that. That foundationally we know that God has a plan, that he loves us and he cares for us because it's that foundation we need when we move into deeper waters. Because when we get into deeper waters, we need to know God loves us because scary things happen in deep waters, don't they? Do sharks attack in the really shallow parts? If you got your feet just wet on the shore, are you pretty safe? When are you in danger? When you go out into the deep. So we need to understand this foundational truth that God loves us and cares for us because when we get into these deep waters, we become a deep church, things get a little more dangerous. Now danger is fun. That's where the excitement is all at. Have you ever watched anyone get on a roller coaster? Have you watched the roller coaster? Is that as exciting as being on the roller coaster? No, no. Not anywhere near as exciting. Now, you may not want that kind of excitement, but it is more exciting being on the roller coaster. It's more exciting moving out into the deep. So Paul tells us there's these foundational things that you need to know, but then verses chapters 4, 5, and 6, he tells us, now that you know these things, if you want to get deeper, what you need to do is do them. And that's where I think fundamentally we make mistakes in the Christian world. We talk about, I want to I wanna go deeper into God's word. So what do we, what, when we say that, what do we really mean? I want to read it and I want to learn the Greek and the Hebrew and I want to know all of the context and how things fit together. Now is all of that good? Yeah. yeah, there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. But can I tell you that that is shallow end stuff? James 1.22 says, if you know God's word, but you don't do it, it's like looking at yourself in a mirror, walking away and forgetting what you look like. And then James later on gets even more, he even gets more on the edge. He says, in fact, if you know what you're supposed to do, but you don't do it, he gives it a nasty word, sin. He says, if you know what God's word says, but you don't do it, then you're just hanging out in the shallow end when you should actually be swimming into the deep end. So Paul tells us what we know, what we're supposed to know, and then he tells us what we're supposed to do, and guess what we need to do to become a deep church and deep people? We need to do it. We've read about it. We've talked about it. I've shared with you. I mean, we had swords and butter knives and all kinds of crazy things, but does any of that matter if we don't put it into practice? No. Uh, Think about these gold, these Olympians that win gold. I mean, isn't what do we know about Olympians that win gold? There's one basic thing we know about them. Yeah, so you went to the second thing. What's the first thing we know? They're talented. They have talent. I mean, I can work my entire life. I can be as dedicated as I want to be. And I can line up for the 100-yard dash (laughs) against Usain Bolt. I could have spent my entire life That dude could get up in the morning, eat a Big Mac, and beat me by 50 yards. At least, right? Why? Because he's got talent. But is that enough? Is talent alone enough? What has Usain Bolt done for his entire life? He's trained. Why? He's so naturally talented. Why would he need to train? He knows everything he needs to know. It's built into his DNA. He doesn't tell his muscles, hey, run. What happens? He runs. And the man runs with gusto. But he still trains. Why? Because he wants to get better. He wants to stay at the top of his game. He wants to go deeper. He wants to be a deeper runner. He wants to become the best runner he can possibly be. And the way he knows to do that is by doing the things he's supposed to do. See, I know I'm not supposed to eat McDonald's if I want to lose weight. But it's not the knowing, it's the doing that matters. 
And I think God has put, he has instilled in us, in all of us, some deep-seated longings. And I want to talk about three of these deep-seated longings. I want you to see, I'm, we're going to put them up on the screen. I want you to see if they are true for you. Here's number one. I'm confident this is true for everyone here. You want to grow closer to God. You don't want to be a shallow Christian. You want to know God better. Do you want to know God better or less? We want to know him better. We want to become everything that God wants us to be. We want to know him and live with him and love him. I, how do you do that? Do you, is it just I want to? Now, there's something that we have to do to make that happen, right? So number one, grow closer to God. Does that work? Is that true for you? Number two, we want to belong and we want to be part of something important. We desperately want to belong to things. Marketing campaigns are built on this whole idea that if you don't have such and such a product, you will be on the outside looking in. That's why people wait for hours to get a smartphone. That's ridiculous. When two weeks after, you're gonna be able to find it, we'll just walk in and pick it off the shelf. Are we so desperate for a phone? What is it about the phone? We want to belong, we want to connect, and we want to be in the cutting edge. We want to be a part of something important. And all of the marketing tells us that you won't be important, you won't belong unless you have this thing, right? You know why that marketing works? Because we have a deep-seated desire to belong. There are club after clubs after club, things you can join. If you can dream of it, you can join a club or buy a magazine for it. I went into the bookstore the other day. Do you know how many magazines there are? I thought they were going out of style. No. You know, literally, do you know how many there are? Yeah, thousands of magazines in the bookstore. And you go online, there's thousands more. If you have a hobby or a desire, there is a magazine for it because we so desperately want to belong. We want to be a part of something, don't we? Is this true for you? Okay, number three, we want to make a real difference. Don't you want to make a difference with your life? I mean, when people are unsatisfied with their jobs, what's one of the number one reasons they give for being unsatisfied? Even if they're paid enough, they can be unsatisfied. Why? Yeah, I'm not doing anything. It's not, is this really making a difference in the world? There are people that will quit six and seven figure jobs and go do something somewhere in the world in a third world country because they want to make a difference in the world. We all want to make a difference, don't we? That's why not a lot of, a lot of people make a career out of serving McDonald's hamburgers because is that very fulfilling? It can be, but is it for most of us? No, I, I would do it for the discount alone, but that's not enough. <laughs> we want to belong and to make a real difference. We want to make a difference at home. That's usually, these three things are why most of you are here, aren't they? We want to get to know God better. We want to belong and be, car, be part of something important. And we want to make a real difference in the world. And you assume that we will help you get there. Is that true? Yeah. It's all what we all want. It's why we're here together. But there's this big question mark we put on top of all of this. We know that's what we want. What's the big question mark? How do I get that? How do I get this? How do I know God better? How do I, how do I become part of something that, that means something? How can I make a real difference in the world? How do I do that? Well, that's what Paul spent six chapters outlining for us. And it's not about knowing, it's about the doing, which is why we're rehashing all of this. Because we may have missed it, we may have heard it, but the question is, are we doing it? Are we living it out? And it takes practice, it takes work to actually have these things. Do you want these things? It takes some work, it takes some doing. So let's talk about what it takes, what we need to do. And by the way, not only am I, be prepared for this, not only am I gonna tell you what should happen, guess what's gonna happen after that? We're going to do something that leads us down that path. So the first thing is we all want to get to know God better. That's great. You know where that begins? You start with God. You start with God in every part of your life. You want to get to know him better? You start with him in the morning. You start with him when you go into work. You start with him at the end of the day. That sounds weird, doesn't it? You start with God at the end of the day. If you want to get to know God better, what should you do? 
Okay, we should pray. Now we're talking about spiritual disciplines. What else should we do? We should read his word. If we pray and read God's word, that's a conversation that we're having with God, yes? I spent up here, how long was I holding Esther? Three, four minutes? There is glitter all over me. There is glitter on my shoe. I assume glitter was in her outfit, right? Now, that doesn't bother me. It's just, it's kind of, am I sparkly? Okay, see, it's awesome. Sparkly pastor today. How did that glitter get on me? Did I put glitter on me? No, how did it get there? It rubbed off. I spent time with Esther. I held Esther and her glitter, whether she was crying or not, that glitter got on me. That's what needs to happen with you and God. Men, when you, when you, at some point in your life, most of us find a woman, a girl that interests us. So here's what we do, guys, right? Tell me if I'm wrong. We just hope that someday we'll accidentally end up on a date with that person. We hope that accidentally we'll propose and she will accidentally say yes and we'll accidentally get married and we'll accidentally live the rest of our lives together. Is that how it works? Those people are called single. (laughs) What do we really do? We have a plan. The most romantic a man will ever be in his entire life is when he does not have the woman of his dreams in his life. He will do everything he can. He will woo her. He will give her flowers. He will read poems. I have never one time heard a man read a love poem and when there wasn't a woman involved. Oh, they practice. But I haven't heard that practice. Right? There's a plan that we put in place. And then, let's say you actually get her to marry you by some miracle. <laughs> then the romance is ju- just is over, right? Ladies, <laughs> careful. Should it be over? I mean, are you done? Are you done talking with one another? No. If you want that marriage to grow, that relationship to grow, even though you've made a commitment to one another, there's more that has to happen. It reminds me of the old joke of the, the old couple. They're like 70 or 80 years old and they're in marriage counseling. They're having trouble in their marriage and the counselor opens up, who would like to start? And she says, I would. He has never once told me that he loves me. And the old guy says, yes, I did. When we got married, I told you I loved you. And I told you if that ever changed, I'd let you know. <laughs> Is that enough? No. The same is true with our relationship with God. If you want to know God, you got to start with God. You have to have an encounter with God. You have to know that God loves and cares for you, which we've talked about. Ephesians 1, 4 through 7 states that very clearly, that God loves you and chose you in Christ. He decided to adopt you into his family because it gives him great pleasure, and he has a plan for your life. Do you believe that God has a plan for your life? Do you believe that God wants to know you? Chapter 2, verse 8 through 10 says, God saved you by his grace when you believed. You can't take credit for that. It's God's gift. Salvation is not a reward for the good things you've done. You are God's masterpiece. He has created you so that you can do the good things that he planned for you to do long ago. You are God's what? His masterpiece. He wants to know you. He has things for you to do. Verse, chapter 3, verses seven, 17 through 19 talks about how much he loves you and how much he wants you to know how much he loves you. How do we know that somebody loves us? How do we have that kind of relationship? We have to hang out with them. We have to get God's glitter all over us by praying and reading God's word and listening to his spirit. It all starts with God. Do you want to know God better? What do you need to do? You need to hang out with God. Are you hanging out with God? When you have a really bad meeting, do you tell God, man, that meeting was bad? Or do you just kind of go on with your life? God, why do you hate me and put me in bad meetings? I'll tell you which one I do. Not the first one. I do the second one. I'm working on it. Number two. Okay, we want to grow closer to God, but we also want to belong and be part of something important, which means we need to engage in community. What's the key word? Engage in community. Uh, Some of you may not know this, but I have a pastor crush. You've heard of a man crush? 
I have a pastor crush, and his name is Andy Stanley. I read everything that he writes. I, one day I will grow up and be just half of what Andy Stanley is, and it'll be good. I love listening to him. I love the things that he says. But one of the most important things he's ever said, and he is absolutely right, is that community is done in circles, not rows. What are you in right now? Rows. This is not community. This is us coming together as a community to learn and to grow, to have an encounter with God together. This is important. But when does real community happen? When we're in circles. When we're in life groups or small groups or in coffee shops, when you're out to breakfast with somebody, when you're sitting across face to face with somebody and you're sharing with them what's going on in your life and they're sharing with you what's going on in your life. This is not, as much as I like to make it as much a conversation as I can, is this a conversation? Has anyone here this morning during this sermon shared with me and with this group what's really going on in your life? No. Can you walk into a church and walk out as lonely when you leave as when you came in? Absolutely. We have to actively engage in community. Paul uses words like unity. We need to be united with one another. He says that you have a role to play in the body of Christ, and we need to love and support and encourage one another. Turn to Ephesians chapter 2. Listen to what Paul says. Ephesians 2, 19. It says, now you Gentiles are no longer strangers and foreigners. You are citizens along with all of God's holy people. You are members of God's family. Did you hear that? Together we are his house built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets and the cornerstone is Christ Jesus himself. We are joined together in him becoming a holy temple for the Lord. Did you hear the imagery there? We are a family and together, how? Together we are the temple of God. And then jump over to chapter four, verse one. He says, I want you to live a life worthy of your calling because you have been called by God. Verse two is where it gets hard. Always be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other, making allowance for each other's faults because of your love. Make every effort to keep yourselves united in the spirit, binding yourselves together in peace. And then jump to verse 31. It says, get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words, and slander, as well of all types of evil behavior. Instead, be kind to each other, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God through Christ has forgiven you. Here's what Paul is saying. If you see a problem in somebody's life, you need to tell everybody in the community about it. You need to be as critical of one another as you possibly can be. Discourage them and create dissension every opportunity that you have. Oh no, that's what some churches do. What are we called to do? Love and make allowance for each other's faults and to forgive one another and, and get rid of this anger and harsh words and slander. We are to come together. He says, verse 16 says, he makes this whole body fit together as each part does its own special works. It helps the other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. Do you know that I cannot become as deep of a Christian as I need to be without you? And you look around this room. You cannot become the person that God wants you to be without other people in your life. We need to have a relationship with God and we need one another. But it doesn't stop there. So we make sure that we have a relationship with God and we make sure that we engage in community. But we also want to make a real difference in the world. How do we make a real difference in the world? Yeah, we live an impactful life. We live a life. Now, does that mean, so, so far, you could do all of this and not everything we've talked about so far. You could do all of everything we've talked about and would you have to even touch a sinner? <laughs> would you have to even look at one? No. But to make a real difference in the world, do you have to? Yes. What did Jesus do? He was accused of it all the time. He hung out with sinners. How could he? How could he possibly hang out with those people? And that's exactly how the Pharisees would say it. How can Jesus hang out with those people? How dare he? Who does he think he is? Doesn't he know that they are unclean? Walk into your work tomorrow and just shout, unclean, <laughs> sinners. <laughs> See how far that gets you, right? Jesus hung out with those people. If you want to make a difference, you got to get your hands dirty. And we can't just talk about it. We gotta do it. 
We gotta make, we gotta, we gotta, we gotta put aside our prejudices. We gotta put aside the things. See, we, we, we've grown closer to God and we've grown closer to one another. Now what we need to do is share that with people who really need it. And Paul talks about this. Ephesians 5 verse one, imitate God therefore in everything that you do. Live a life filled with love, following the example of Christ. What did Christ do? He loved people. He loved the unworthy. He loved the people that nobody else loved. He touched people nobody else would touch. He lived a life, an impactful life, caring for and loving the people who needed him the most. And we are called to do the exact same thing. We are called to make a difference in the world. And how do we do that? We share the love of Jesus Christ. We just do what we've already done. We tell people, I've got a relationship with God and you can have one too. Can I love and encourage and support you? I've got a group of people that you could come hang out with. Oh, but I'm not a good person. If I, I've heard people say, if I walked into a church, God would strike me dead. And I say, no, uh because I walked in and it was fine. <laughs> Trust me, church is full of hypocrites. Yeah, it is. Boy, do we need help. Come join us, you hypocrite. We need to make an impactful difference in people's lives.